E.G. Marshall. Why, you may ask, does everyone so eagerly wish to know the future? Shall we not arrive there soon enough? And what is this passion to foretell the future? Isn't it better to be surprised? And suppose you could read the future. What good would it do you? What good did it do the prophets of old? Who listened to them? Sahib! Sahib, I have seen her! Seen who? The Mem Sahib! I have seen her! You have seen my wife? She appeared to me on the road. Give my salams to thy master, she said, and tell him I shall see him at Nudea. Nudea? Where is Nudea? She says that thou shalt find it at the proper time. But my wife... My wife is dead. mystery drama, By Word of Mouth, was especially adapted from a story by Rudyard Kipling for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Court Benson. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The year is 1943 on Walton's Mountain. You'll want to share the heartwarming stories of love and sacrifice as World War II brings growth and change to America's favorite family. Next, the exotic beauty of Hawaii's tropical paradise is the setting for volcanic adventure and heart-stopping action with Jack Lord and an exciting new Hawaii 5 team. Then, Buddy Epson and Barnaby Jones teamed up for a new season of suspense and drama with Betty and Jr. Barnaby Jones, the private eye who's easygoing on the outside while he fights to put the bad guys on the inside. Thursdays are a night to remember this fall on CBS Television. killed by overwork than the importance of the world justifies, said Mr. Rudyard Kipling, who was no stranger to overwork himself. As a matter of fact, many of Kipling's stories are concerned with serious people who worked very hard and wound up with very little to show for it. Here's one of them. It shall be narrated in the words of the master himself. explained by those who know how souls are made and where the bounds of the possible are put down. I have lived long enough in India to know that it is best to know nothing and I can only write the story as it happened. Edward Dumoise was our civil surgeon at Madiki in the Punjab. He was a pleasant, easy-going young man who never quarreled with anyone except when it came to saving lives. Edward. Hello, Kipling. What's this I hear about you? Uh, that would depend on whom you've been talking to. Uh, do you actually intend to enter the Malahide Temple? If I have to. Edward, no European is permitted inside. Then let them bring her out. Well, you'll provoke a riot in the city. They can't surround that poor, sick little girl with a veil of dark superstition. You cannot violate a Malahide Temple. I'm a doctor. They happen to be a warrior caste. There could be a riot. This little girl will die if she's not treated immediately. She could very likely start an epidemic. Edward, she's not some poor little girl. She's a princess. She's the daughter of a Dunbar Raja. All the more reason to save her life. Edward, you're new to India. Let me explain. This high-born princess has been dedicated to the temple. She is a virgin priestess. No European is supposed to look at her. No man of any kind is even supposed to touch her. Well, that's too bad. Because the fact is, I do have to look at her. And I do have to touch her. And I'll do it as modestly and respectfully as I can. No, their law says you can't. Would they rather she died? Yes. But well, that's too simple an answer. Why? Doesn't it state the fact? The fact, yes. The idea, no. Her illness has been cursed on her by all the gods and goddesses who make up the pantheon of the Malahide religion. It is their will that she die. But why? What did she do? Um, perhaps her beauty excited the envy of a jealous goddess. Who knows? I do. And so do you. She most likely drank some polluted water. Edward, the colonel has asked me to use persuasion. I'm a civil servant. The colonel has no right. The colonel is thinking of the overall situation. Kipling, if you have your carriage outside, 
Could you give me a lift to the temple? What could I do? There was no reasoning with him. The square in front of the temple was crowded. Word had spread that the Ingrazi doctor intended to cure the virgin priestess. The mob parted reluctantly to let my carriage through. But at the gate was the biggest, brawniest Malahai high priest I have ever seen. And he had the biggest sword, too. What do you hear, unbeliever? Why do you call me an unbeliever? I believe the same things you do. That God is good, God is great, and that all of us are his children. Go pray in your own temple. Am I not welcome to pray in yours? No. Why? Because you are an unbeliever. Oh, we're back to that. The, uh, the great lady of your temple is you. She will die. If it is the will of Mother High. Think you so? I say it is the will of evil devils in the water. How dare you blaspheme against the Mother High? If I have blasphemed against him, let him strike me down. Well, why does the ground still remain firm beneath my feet? Why does the earth not swallow me up? Priest, open the temple gate. We shall enter. Do not try my patience, priest. I said, open the gate. You within. Open the gate. You, you want to come along, Kipling? <laughs> no, I'm in this deep. I wonder if we'll ever get out of it alive. I had never been in a Malahai temple. I was not prepared for the riches, the beauty. The walls, it seemed, were of gold and encrusted with diamonds and rubies. Everywhere one looked were immense silver statues. What wealth while the people starved. We came to a larger room. It was sparsely and simply furnished. In the center was a bed. On the bed was a girl, a young woman, perhaps 20 years old, with radiant black hair and the most beautiful face I had ever seen, even though it was strained by pain and illness. I will examine the priestess. Examine. That's what I said. You will advance no further. I intend to cure the priestess. Weave your spell from where you stand. Oh, that's impossible. I must take a pulse. A respiration study, the coloration of her skin. Give her this medicine. The Malahai forbids it. Then let the Malahai stop me. Edward, don't, don't be a fool. Come back. Let's get out of here. Edward, before it's too late. It's too late now. Good morning, Most Reverend Priestess. Do you speak English? I'm afraid my Hindi isn't very good. I haven't been very long in the country. Can you... Tell me where it hurts. No, Edward. Don't reach for her hand. Well, let me feel your pulse at any rate. <sighs> well, son, you've gone ahead and done it. Old man, you want to give me a hand here? I may as well be hanged for a jackass instead of a goat. Much obliged. Now, uh, open up that medical bag. Uh, give me the small bottle. Uh, that, that's the one. It what? I think we can take the fever down. They expect her to die. She's not out of the woods yet. But don't you see, Edward... Now they can blame it on you. On me? You forced your way inside. You defiled the holy high priestess. And that's why she died. I'll, uh, I'll take a larger bottle, too. No, 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 the other one. Uh, uh, that's it. It'll be an excuse for rioting, bloodletting. She has a chance. Well, your highness, you feel a little bit better? Can you breathe a little more easily? Yes. Uh, don't try to talk yet. Uh, you there, priest. Listen. She is to be given a spoonful from this large bottle every two hours, a spoonful from a small bottle every four hours. They're not going to do what you tell them. But they have to. Do you think they would would dare to touch any of your medicines? Well, if they won't take care of her, I'll just have to do it myself. And he did. He stayed three days in that temple and nursed her round the clock. On the fourth day, he staggered out of there and into my waiting carriage. She's going to be all right. She's going to live. She is? Yes. The fever's down. True color is back. She has an appetite. Yes, she's a healthy young lady again. How long do you think she'll live, Edward? Uh, I don't know what the life expectancy is in India, Kipling, but uh, for a young woman of her rank and position... Well, I would say... 
She might expect to live about a week. What did you say? She's been defiled by your touch. But I cured her. And since she's been defiled, she will be turned out of the temple. Her family also will cast her out. No one will have anything to do with her. But this... This is... This is the way it is. It will actually turn her out into the street? Yes. I find that impossible to believe. In India, find nothing impossible to believe. She'll be lucky if they don't stone her to death. It's my fault. Not really. If you hadn't treated her, she'd have died in any case. What's that? They're going to open the temple gate. Look. That's her. The priestess. The former priestess. What's going to happen? I told you what was going to happen. People of the city, behold the priestess who is priestess no longer. Defiled and polluted by the eyes and the hands of the unbelievers. Behold, one who is already dead. In her is no longer the spirit of life. But the evil demons that are part of the black magic of the infidels. You, Lala, daughter of kings, princess and priestess no longer. Be gone from us. Let no true believer give her food or drink, or shelter. For this will only strengthen the evil demons within her. Be gone, Lala. Be gone. What are we going to do? I shall speak to the regimental chaplain. Father Victor's a good sort. He arranged to have her sent to a school for native girls somewhere far from here. No. But it's the best we can do for her. Is it? At this time and in this place, realistically, yes. No. We can do better than that. Where are you going? It was obvious. He jumped down from the carriage, shouldered his way through the crowd, and caught up with her. He took her by the arm. You could hear a gasp from the crowd and see a shudder pass through her body. And very gently, he led her back to the carriage and helped her up onto the seat. Drop us off at my place, Kipling. She'll stay with me. Edward, do you know what you're doing? Some weeks went by. I forgot about Edward. After all, I had a newspaper to get out. But I was starting to hear rumors. Rumors I simply couldn't credit. Finally, Mrs. Hawksby came into the office. Mrs. Hawksby, our social arbiter, who knew everything about everyone. Mr. Kipling, I'll come right to the point. Whatever are we going to do about Edward Dumois? Well, do we have to do anything, dear Mrs. Hawksby? Dear Mr. Kipling, he's a most promising young man, an exceptional surgeon. He must not be permitted to throw away his chances for a brilliant career. He'll be ostracized. The girl is living in his house, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there is any uh, improper conduct between them. Unfortunately, that's true. He simply cannot marry a native girl. Marry? Who said anything about marriage? He has already asked Father Victor to perform the ceremony. Well, it, it, it's impossible. Weren't you the one who told me that nothing is impossible in India? Yes. He wants to marry her? But I thought there was a girl back in England. All of you bachelors out here in India say you have a girl back in England. <laughs> I wonder if it's the same one. Well, if he wants to marry her, I... I don't know what's to be done about it. In a sense, it's all your fault. My fault? Well, at the very least, you're an accessory. You were the one who drove him to the temple. You got him into it. Now, it's your responsibility to get him out of it. Even before you have a chance to prepare your defense, you discover, as Mr. Kipling did, that the jury has already returned with the verdict. What they probably want him to do is to talk with Dr. Edward Dumois, something he's already done before with very little success. Well, he gets another chance at it in Act Two. Shall meet. 
said Mr. Rudyard Kipling. But here he has gone ahead and violated his very own tenet in the story that he has written for us. Because Mr. Kipling did stage a meeting between East and West. And not just a meeting, but a marriage. To continue... Are you feeling all right, Mr. Kipling? No, I haven't come here to talk about myself. I know. You've come to talk about me. Join the club. I know what you'll tell me. Physician, heal thyself. Mm. From what disease? From the worst disease a young man can catch. Nonconformity. Edward, you're sacrificing your prospects for a career. I'm not concerned with a career. All I want to do is practice medicine. And that's all you will do for the rest of your life. But isn't that exactly what I was trained to do? Edward, there are things to be considered in a marriage. Just one thing. Love. And we are in love. Ah, love. Oh, she's beautiful, Kipling, the most beautiful woman in the world. God, I agree, but this is India. Why does everyone keep saying this is India? This is India. Why are things different in India? She's beautiful now, Edward. Ravishing. But it doesn't last long. They bloom early, these lovely Indian blossoms, and they wither early. Well, she'll be 30 and she'll look like 60. Scrawny and bony, or else fat and squat. Well, excuse me, I'm, 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 I'm only stating the conventional wisdom. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And her beauty is fixed in my eye forever. Have you uh, stated your case, or is there anything else you might care to add? The rules could be bent a bit, perhaps, because she is, after all, a princess. And the very word royalty is enough to throw sand in the eyes of any proper Englishman. But she's an outcast. I know all your arguments, and I'm sure you know all my answers in advance. So, why not join me in a toast for the bride? Hey there, put on thing. Two whiskey pegs, now. Um, but that's another thing. How do you manage to keep a native servant? Oh, what I'm seeing is a Sikh. He doesn't tell with his malahai sort of thing. Besides, he adores her. Fairly worships her, as a matter of fact. Are you sure you, you're not being seduced by this romantic, youthful conceit of two against the world? I was hoping we could be five. Five? Yes, uh, oh, uh, thank you, Rosanthi. Uh, Mr. Kipping likes his without... Oh, I see, you know. Um, how is the princess? She rests, and the world must stand still until the heaven-born awakes. Which is as it should be. Uh, thank you, Rosanthi. You may go. Um, you, you said you hoped we would be five. Yes, um, Lala and I, that's two. Father Victor, who will perform the ceremony, that's three. Rosan Singh, who approves completely, makes four. And I was hoping uh, you would stand up for me. Oh. I'm sorry, I asked. There's really no reason for you to become mixed up in this disreputable affair. No oh, nonsense. <laughs> I'm, I'm considered somewhat disreputable myself. After all, I'm a writer, you know. <laughs> to the bride. To the bride. And so they were married. As they say in a million stories, <laughs> including quite a few of my own. If I had thought she was beautiful when I had seen her lying ill in the temple, she was positively radiant at her wedding. And each day, if possible, she grew fairer. She was seen only on rare intervals when she would ride in her carriage driven by the faithful Routon scene. And men would stop to stare at her and women to sigh. And everyone was wrong about Edward's being cast out of society. He was besieged with invitations to dinners, balls, parties, but he refused them all. I'll come right to the point, Mr. Kipling. We must do something about poor Edward Dumois. Oh, isn't that too late now, Mrs. Hawkesbury? Whatever are you talking about? Well, he went and did the unspeakable, didn't he? He married a native girl. My dear Kipling, there are native girls, and there are native girls. Oh, I've always been aware of that. Besides... Beauty makes its own laws. We are too few in the land and too dependent on each other. He simply must come out into society with his wife. Well, why don't you tell him that? I have, but he won't listen to me. Well, isn't it obvious he doesn't listen to me either? You're supposed to be clever. Can't you think of something? 
But I thought I would become an outcast, a pariah. Oh, so all my good friends took such great pains to tell me. Oh, what can we do with the world? Take it as we find it. Now, you, you must get out more. It isn't fair to Lala. Lala is quite content to remain at home. Well, then it isn't fair to you. But I don't care to go out. I have another life now. Well, of course you do. You're a married man. But that doesn't mean that, that nothing, no one else exists. Nothing and no one exists for me but Lala. Oh, dear. You, you must also live in the world. We have a world of our own. I never dreamed such a world could exist. I come home. It's as if I'm transported to another planet. A strange and wonderful place. I don't want to leave it. I don't want to leave her. Oh, we're so happy, Kipling. So happy. It was a marriage that was first sung in heaven and brought down to earth in perfect harmony. Of course, protocol demanded that they give the occasional dinner party. But these were few and far between. To visit their house on these rare occasions was a treat for the heart. She was radiant. Well, you're waiting for the serpent to enter this Garden of Eden, and I shall not disappoint you. One day, she fell ill. Is Dr. Maitland still up at Simla? Maitland? Um, what month is April? Well, he usually goes on a hunting holiday. We could send someone to the hills to rout him out. I don't know what to make of it. She has a fever that simply won't go down. I've tried everything. Well, can you consult with anyone else? Maitland's the man for this sort of thing. Hmm. Oh, we could telegraph Simla and ask we them if... We don't have that much time. Oh. I didn't know it was that serious. Well, neither did I till this morning. Kipling, if anything should happen, I... I just don't know what I shall do. Mind if I come in? Oh, Strickland. No, no, by all means. I uh, hope I'm not interrupting anything. No, not at all, not at all. Just getting ready to close up shop and pop over to see Edward Dumois. How are things in the police department? Okay, that's why I'm here. In my official capacity. I've got Rudolf Singh in custody. What? You've arrested him? Why? What's he done? He took after the high priest to the Malahai temple with a knife. Good Fortunate thing, a few of my constables were nearby, else he would have killed the fellow. It'd have been a rope, for sure. Well, do you know why he did it? Yes, he, he claims that the Malahai have cast a spell, a death spell on Lala. It can only be removed by the blood of their high priest. Do you believe this nonsense? What, what shall you do with him? I don't want to bother Edward at a time like this. I can release what's on scene in the custody of a responsible person. Are you willing? Oh, well, of course, of course. Of course. Poor Edward. You think she's going to die? Well, don't you? It's all too beautiful, too perfect. And the gods are too jealous. The gods. You know what, Strickland? I think you and I have been in India too long. Should have killed the pig, Kipling Sahib. Now, but you, we shall have no more of that, Rajon Singh. I bear responsibility for thee to the government. Surely, Kipling Sahib is aware that the swine will bring death to my heaven born mistress. Go thou now to the house of thy master, who requires thy services in this time of great need. But someone must kill a dog if the divine one is to live. Get thee hence to thy duties, or I shall have the warder return you to jail. sit amongst the miracles of the 19th century, the telephone, the telegraph, the incandescent lamp, the railroad, the steamboat, and to the average native here in India, these things are all works of magic. And yet there is another magic here in this ancient land, a magic that controls the mind, the body, life and death. I was tempted to go to the Malahai priest and ask him, or bribe him to remove the spell. <laughs> the spell. Listen to what I'm saying. But of course that wouldn't do. I went instead to Edward's house. I think she's better. Look, there's more color. She... No. No, she's worse. I know she's worse. Try to be calm, Edward. How can I be calm? 
I'm helpless. I'm, I'm supposed to be a doctor, but I, I can't find anything wrong with her. She, she keeps getting weaker and weaker. Why? It could be some germ we know nothing about. Edward. Edward. Oh, darling. Uh, darling, don't try to speak. I must speak. I... I am being punished. Punished? Oh, my sweet, innocent uh, darling. What did you ever do to deserve punishment? I... I was given in marriage to the god Malahai. No, darling. I was the bride of the god Malahai. And he summoned me to... to his palace in... in the heavens. Oh, you mustn't say a thing like that, dearest. Uh, and so... I lay there on my deathbed in the temple, waiting for him. And then I saw you, and I became false to my vow, because I fell in love with you, Edward. Darling, darling, try to preserve your strength. Uh, and you fought with him for me, and your magic won. But you cannot triumph for long. Because you are only mortal, and he is a god. Just hold on to my hand, Lala. Here. Hold my hand. He, he sent for me. Darling, you're going to get well. I must leave you now, but I shall meet you very soon. Nudia, Nudia. are dead or alive. It's Mr. Rudyard Kipling's story. Let him continue to tell it. Everyone at the station turned out for the funeral. Poor Edward. He broke down utterly at the brink of the grave and had to be taken away. After a while, he went back to work. He did his usual competent job. But he refused to be comforted. He obviously needed a vacation and a change of scene. I tried to convince him to take one. I don't feel like going on leave. But do you the world of good, Edward? There's no good left in this world for me. Oh, um, could you do me a favor? Ask. You have all those maps and atlases and encyclopedias in your office. Find out where Nudea is. Nudea? Lala mentioned it just before she died. Nudea? Well, uh, I don't know what it can be. She was delirious, poor girl. Nudea could refer to almost anything. Could you try to look it up? There are thousands and thousands of remote towns and villages all over India that are completely unknown to the rest of the country once you get walking distance away. Now that you mention walking, uh, how about going with me on a walking tour? No, thanks. Well, just for a few weeks. We can take pictures, do a little shooting. Come on, Edward. You just can't stay here where every stick of furniture, the very paint on the walls, keeps reminding you of Lala. Wherever I go, I'll always be reminded of Lala. Well, then, let's go to the hills and breathe the clear, cool air. And shoot the tiger with a gun or a camera, whatever you fancy. I talked him into it, finally. 
And so, taking Rutor's scene along to do for us, we went up to the hill country. And we hunted and fished. And we breathed the pure air of the mountains. Slowly, the healing process began. Rutor seems a bit put out. Well, not exactly, but I think he expected a little more mourning on Edward's part. Edward, Sahib, he forgets. He forgets. It is well that the gods send us forgetfulness, Rutor Singh. Else our hearts should never be mended. He forgets the heaven-born. No, she remains in his heart still. But what is one to do? One must continue to live. I am afraid, Kipling Sahib. An old soldier such as thou? <laughs> what could frighten thee? I fear he will not go to her when she calls to him to meet her in Nudea. Nudea? Hast thou heard of New Day, Ritam Singh? No, but surely its location shall be revealed to us at the proper time. Beautiful night. Yes, and so peaceful. Is it? Really? Listen. <laughs> How quiet on the surface. There's no peace in India, Kipling. Do you know it? You're a handful, and we rule over hundreds of millions. Underneath, you can sense her seething. Mm. One day, they'll rise up against us, drive us out of the land. Mm. Perhaps. You doubt it. Neither of us may live to see it. We must prepare them for that day, Kipling. So that when we are tossed out of this country, they shall be able to rule themselves decently. Hmm. I understand. You're closer to these things than I am. Are we preparing them? On the whole, yes. There are those who believe we could be doing more. I don't know. We must drive out these base and ignorant superstitions. My wife. You only saw beauty in her, but there was more. There was a woman of remarkable intelligence. And yet, you heard her on her deathbed. Yes. She devoutly believed that she was betrothed to a god. That he sent for her. You know, while she spoke those words, I believed it too. So did I. <laughs> We've been away. I don't know. Um, I seem to have lost track of the calendar. But that's a sign we're having a good time, isn't it? Yes, we are. But it's over. I have to go back to work. I have sick bodies to look after. And sick minds. He seemed to have changed from a boyish, pleasant, happy-go-lucky chap to a mature man of serious purpose. He said his work would be a monument to his dead wife. And the best way to mourn her would be to help liberate her country. One night, we were sitting on his veranda when we saw a man running toward the house. Why, it's Rutan Singh. Oh, impossible. I never saw him like that. Why, well, you're right. Shaheem! Shaheem! What is it, Rutan Singh? Why dost thou run like the nil guy that is being chased by the tiger? Oh, Shaheem! The man appears frightened out of his wits. What is it? I, I have seen the heaven-born. Thou hast... What? I have seen the man Shaheem. Oh, thou hast seen her in a dream? Nay, on the road. Where? Near the village. She was standing by the side of the road. She was wearing the blue dress. She lifted the veil of her bonnet. Root Singh, she said, give my salams to the Shaheem and tell him I shall meet him next month at Nudea. Where? Nudea. Yes. Then, uh, uh, what did you do? Then I ran away because I was afraid, Sahib. Uh, uh, go thou inside. Ha have something to eat. But I saw the heaven-born. The Sahib must believe me. I believe you. I see her myself every day, every night. Always. Now, now go inside. Eat. Rest. I will do as the Sahib commands. You see how much work we have to do with these people, Kippen? Only with these people, Edward? Hmm. And ourselves. Kipling, Sahib. Come in, Rutan Singh. Sahib, I have seen the heaven-born. What, again? Even so. Well, hast, hast thou spoken of it to thy master? No. And why not? 
The heavenborn appeared to me again in the proud fields behind the house. And again she said, Rutan Singh, give my salams to thy master and say to him that tomorrow I shall send for him to meet me in New Dea. Tomorrow? Even so, Sahib. But I fear greatly to say this to my master. Why? Because he will go to her. Well, it seems to me that only a short time ago, thou wast afraid he would not go to her. That was when I was blinded by my grief. And now? Now I know he will go to his death. And he must not. He is needed here. We have so many sick, so many, and he must heal them. Therefore, I shall not give him the message from the heaven born. Is this right? Thou art a man, Rutal Singh. The decision is thine. I have already made it. But another decision had also been made at the government headquarters in Simla. The Surgeon General had sent a telegram to Dr. Edward Dumois at Murdiki in the Punjab. Terrible outbreak of cholera in Udair in Bengal. Doctors urgently need it. Request you volunteer for service if you can be spared from your present duties. Detailed instructions of how to travel to Nadea who follow. Nadea? There's no question about it. I'll go. Edward, wait. Can you be spared? For a few weeks, a month or two, why not? The patent can cover for me in case of any emergencies. Edward, you haven't been ordered. I've been asked. Cholera. It kills more doctors than patients. Well, that's no reason to refuse. Sahib, I have heard the news. Good. Uh, start now, then, to pack a kit. No, Sahib. No, do not go. What is this? The Sahib goes to his death. Go to thy room and begin to pack. Sahib, it is not right. Go, Rutan Singh, I command thee. Edward. What is it? Don't go. You too? Don't go. You won't come back. I can't think of that. How did she know about Mordea? Tell me how. Well, as you said, she was delirious. She was raving. She spoke a word. We don't even know it was Nudea. Oh, it's a coincidence. The, those are your own words. They were my words. Then for all your education and background, the fact is you believe in superstition. I neither believe nor do I disbelieve. I'm only saying that if you go, you have every chance to die of cholera. It's true. But I have no choice. My dear fellow, you can plead heavy workload here. No one will think the less of you. If I refuse to go, my work here will be over. Nonsense. My useful work. My larger work. My work against the diseases, not just of the body, but of the mind. I don't see how. Everyone will say I stayed home because I was afraid to face my fate. No nonsense. Shall I then tell the native mother that a child does not get sick and die because there is an evil demon who wishes to eat him, but simply because she did not boil the water he drinks? You see, Kipling, I cannot convince the people by showing them germs under a microscope. I can only go to Nadea to fight against fate. But if you die there, what good would that do? At least I will have died fighting evil. And I will not have been proved wrong. I will only have lost a battle. My successor will have a chance to win the war. But still, I have no choice. And you know it. I'm right. Yes. You're right. <laughs> I never saw him again. Three weeks later, I received a telegram from the chief public health officer at New Dare, a remote village in Bengal, which was in the heart of the plague area. And it said that Dr. Edward Dumois died suddenly of the cholera after working day and night without rest. As a personal note, the surgeon added that he died with a smile on his face. I would like to believe that Lala was waiting for him. But he has not forgotten. Rutal Singh carries on. Daily he walks through the village, admonishing, threatening. Mudhead! Boil that water! You there! Wash the child's hands before he is permitted to eat! Open the door! Let there be fresh air and light! Why has this little one not been taken to the dispensary? For the vaccinations. 
fools. There are no evil spirits. There are only germs. And thus it is truly said, no man ever dies while his words and his works endure. Amen. And the words and the works of men like Edouard Dumois continue to this day, even though India is no longer the British Raj. And whatever human glory that faraway land achieves in times to come, men like Edward Dumois shall be a part of it. I shall be back shortly. <laughs> and now, Kava Classroom. 30 intellectual seconds of coffee drinking pleasure with smooth and friendly Kava Instant Coffee. A great tasting coffee that's 90% acid neutralized. Kava is good news for us smart guys who are sometimes bothered by ordinary coffee. Because acid neutralized Kava means less acid in the cup. So graduate to the smooth coffee. Have a cup of 90% acid neutralized. <laughs> Try Kava, the smooth and friendly coffee. I'm not the handiest person in the world, but nowadays, do-it-yourself home repair is almost a necessity. I try painting and even woodworking, but I never dabble with electricity because it can be dangerous and not forgiving of carelessness. Yes, Americans are learning how to do more with their hands and hopefully are not forgetting some of the old rules, like never mixing water and electricity and using only a qualified electrician to work on house wiring. A public service announcement from Underwriters Laboratories in this station. these things are never clear cut or open and shut. Did Dr. Dumois go because he felt he had to fight the demons of superstition? Or did he go because he wanted to see his beloved Lala? That depends on you. Because it depends on what kind of story you want. If you're looking for a tale of heroism and dedication, you can choose the first interpretation. If you want a tale of romantic love that endures beyond the grave, you may use the second. You see... With us, you can have it both ways. Our cast included Court Benson, Carol Titel, William Griffiths, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I'll get a lawyer. You can't get away with this. You're mad. You may need a lawyer. What are you doing? What's that you're taking out of your pocket? Uh, just some very strong bandages, my dear. And unless you want to get the beating of your life, you will do exactly as you're told. Oh, don't! You're hurting me! I need to know where you are and what you're up to for the next 24 hours. That's why I'm oh. tying you up and why I shall lock you in. And let me warn you, you can scream, but all you'll cause is a scandal. So I advise you to keep quiet until I return. There. Is that tight enough? Oh, um, do you see this revolver? Oh, no. Yes, I agree with you. I'd rather keep it in my pocket than use it. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. freed by Iran are heading home. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. The hostages underwent medical checks at a U.S. hospital in West Germany and are flying back to the United States. Their plane is due to land at Andrews Air Force Base outside Washington about nine hours from now. Forty-nine other hostages, most of them Americans, remain inside the American embassy in Tehran, where they've been captive since November 4th. Iranian students are threatening to kill them if the United States takes military action against Iran. The State Department has accused the Ayatollah Khomeini of inciting a riot Wednesday at the American Embassy in Islamabad, Pakistan.